And welcome to Video Game Hangover. I'm Randy Dickinson, and I'm in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Hello, I'm DJ Ross. I'm in Mountain View, California. Each week here on Video Game Hangover, we talk about the games that have been keeping us up at night. This week, that list includes Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. Checking out the... What else we do? We're checking out the... I I phrased this weird in the outline, and I just realized it as I'm reading it live into the show. (laughs) Uh, we are also checking out the Live Alive demo, and I finally got my hands on the play date. Oh, with who? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's the that's the thing. That's the uh-huh. segment. We'll get to it. Okay. Oh, interesting. All right. Yep. It's not really. It's not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. Play date. <laughs> it's a, instant. It's burn. a play date with a tiny little yellow Game Boy type of thing. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak makes me think of Sun Chips, and now I want Sun Chips. Sun Chips, yeah. You just want to tear into one of those very noisy bags. <laughs> and play some Monster Hunter. Yeah. Yep. I don't know what's going on with Sunbreak. I've, I've never heard that combination of words before. I don't know if that's a thing. Like, I, I guess it is, because, like, I mean, there's, like, Sunrise, right? But, I mean, it's already mm-hmm. called Monster Hunter Rise, so they probably couldn't call it that. Oh, Monster Hunter Sunrise. Yeah, Monster Hunter Rise Sunrise. That's a little <laughs> weird. Like, Dawn can break. They didn't go with that, though. They didn't go with Monster Hunter Rise Dawn break. It's Dawn sun break. break. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I don't know. Making up their own words. So this is the new DLC for Monster Hunter, right? It is, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get into that at some point. Yeah. Other things, pre-show banner, any, any, uh, <laughs> any you want to, uh, anything going on in life? Any, um, anything newsworthy you'd like to report on? Uh, not especially. I've been just all over the place and what I'm playing. I, uh, feel like we could just chat for three hours about random stuff. Like, uh, okay. back into Minecraft a little bit. Wow. Really, uh, going hard on that Hatsune Miku music game, but, uh, I'll save it for another show. I've uh, I've been doing the same as well. We took um as you know uh, what con- consistent listeners of the show know we took last week off, um had some life stuff going on and uh, have been playing, you know just a little bit of everything since. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, we had a what a Nintendo Direct last week or, or a mini Direct kind of situation, and they um, stealth released the Portal Companion Pack, which includes Portal <laughs> and Portal Two on the switch and i went hey i was looking for an excuse to play portal again so are you gonna play some portal i've already been playing portal again <laughs> excellent excellent yep. yes I, i've played both of these games at least once in the past and i uh, still find myself quite stuck sometimes in some of the puzzles i'm like all right how how do i get out of this well it's probably been and, quite a while since the last time you played it yeah there's something kind of humbling about looking up a walkthrough for a 10 year old game though (laughs) like a game you've already played and beaten and i'm like nope you got me again game (laughs) have they uh they updated any of the walkthroughs for the uh the switch edition somebody's just like well to finish this puzzle you need to actually detach the joy cons and like swing them (laughs) around the room or something like that (laughs) you've got to put it in the leg strap from the fitness game and run in place with it yeah exactly no nothing that i've i've found it i'm 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 finding walkthroughs from the pc version of it that still apply so um you have to slot one of the joy cons into your cardboard portal gun that you built (laughs) right exactly that would be amazing i'd be all over that that's how you get me to buy a labo kit I still have that bazooka or whatever that I built whenever that was several years ago at this point is just sitting in the corner of my living room where it's been since, oh man, that was pre pandemic, most likely. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, what am I supposed to do with this thing? You don't break it out and do some bazooka ing every now and then? No, I can't say I do. No. So I would be thrilled if it worked with the portal version, but uh, I imagine that's not the case. <laughs> yeah. I would just, I would love a cardboard portal gun. That'd be cool. 
<laughs> well, somebody's got to be working on that, right? Yeah, I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. It's better if I don't know. Somebody they got their uh, budget portal cosplay instructions. You can just <laughs> download and print out. <laughs> yep. I can't have that in my head, though. I'll start obsessing over it. Yeah. I won't be able to sleep until I've completed my cardboard portal gun. Is that a bad thing? It sounds like you're making it out to be a bad thing, having this cardboard portal gun, but it sounds like <laughs> you, you actually really want one. Uh, I mean, I would take one if one was on offer. Sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do, are, are you offering? Do you have a cardboard portal gun for me? Uh, not at this moment. No, no. no. I was going to say, just, we'll just put your home address in the show notes this week and somebody sure. can mail it to you. <laughs> I've had luck with that in the past. I was complaining, or you, if you probably remember many, many years ago, I was complaining about uh, the lack of uh, availability of, a, of an amiibo I was looking for, and someone on the show had one to send me. Yeah, um, well, see, there so, you go. Somebody yeah. is listening to this right now, just going, oh, I made too many cardboard portal guns last weekend, mm. and what am I going to do? If, if you are uh, that person, randy at vghangover.com, <laughs> uh, hit me up. We'll be friends. Fantastic. Yeah. God, I really hope that happens. <laughs> Stay tuned next week. We'll see how this goes. Yeah. It'll be the person who is listening to our show like a week at a time, but from 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. 10 years yeah. from now, you'll get a, a cardboard portal right. gun in the mail. <laughs> Just be like, what? What? <laughs> July 7th, 2032. I, I fully expect UPS to pull up to my uh, to my house. Um uh, by drone at that point, I'm sure, yeah. to deliver a cardboard portal gun. Yeah. It'll be just in time for the Switch Pro reissue of Portal 1 and 2. <laughs> the Xbox Series Q? <laughs> it's going to be back to Xbox One at that point. What honest. letters haven't they used yet? Yeah, exactly. Um, and we'll still be on the PlayStation 5 because nobody can find one. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, I need <laughs> one at some point. <laughs> yeah. For what? What do you want to play on it? I want to play that new Final Fantasy game when it comes out uh, next year. But uh, So I have a year in which uh, I should probably buy one. All right, we'll get on that. I, I will, but you know, very slowly. <laughs> well, here's your chance, DJ. Do you want to give out your home address? Or? Yes, if people just send me the, the spare <laughs> PS5s they have lying around. I sure have that, one lying uh, around the house, yeah. Definitely going to happen. I've got a... Um, I've been slowly sort of cleaning out the loft above the garage at my house. And there's a lot of like stuff up there that I'm sort of like, do I throw it away? Does it have value to somebody? Should I try to sell it? And this is the hoarder's dilemma, right? And I can't throw that away because it's precious to me in some way, or I can make money off of it. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I have uh, unearthed and I don't know what to do with is my old backwards compatible 80 gigabyte PS3. Ooh. Um, don't make that noise yet because it is a yellow light of death. It does not boot up. Oh, okay. Um, so it's a paperweight unless you're smart enough and know how to solder. Uh, <laughs> whatever the dilemma is at the bottom of this thing that needs to be fixed. Uh, yeah. So it's not a functioning PS3, but it will do cool things and play yeah. PS2 games if uh, if somebody knows how to fix that. But yeah, but it could potentially be. So I don't know. Should I? I feel bad, like, just pitching it in a dumpster. Should I bring it to, like, an electronics recycling thing? Would somebody want it? Probably somebody would want it, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't know where PS3 emulation is at these days. Yeah. I would just put it up and be like, 100 bucks for this broken PS3 as is. <laughs> or, uh, you know, see how much they're going for first. Right, yeah. I don't know what the market is for these things. I've not done the research. But I'm also concerned that, like, somebody could fix it get it running again, and it would still somehow have my personal information on it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I can't fix it to turn it on to find out what's in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember if I wiped it before I boxed it up and put it in the garage. I have no clue what the status of my PlayStation 3 is at this point. So, mm, Well, in that case, you might want to fix it before you sell yeah. it off. So, again, back to the garage with it, I think. <laughs> I had the same thing happen to my PS3 back in the day. And I think, so I ended up taking it to a place and they fixed it for like, I don't know, 50 or 60 bucks. And my plan was to just boot it up, erase all my stuff from it and like wipe the hard drive and then just get rid of it. And I have done none of that. So <laughs> hopefully it still will boot up long enough for me to do that at some point. Yeah. But uh, I'm not incredibly urgent on my list. No, it's not mine either, but I like, I have, you know, I have a lot of stuff. You get to a point in life where you have a lot of stuff. 
Yeah. And I'm at that point and I, I, f- I feel like maybe I would be a happier person if I had less things. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Is your PS3 still sparking joy? Sounds like <laughs> not. <laughs> nope. It's a source of stress for me now. Um, mm. yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Maria Kondo would be very disappointed in me. <laughs> well, she'll take it. She'll know what to do with it. She, right, exactly. She knows a guy. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'll work on that. Yeah. Or just, you know, keep it up in your attic for another yes. 10 years. Continue to trip over it. Move it to more more new houses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you never know. You might need to you know, prop a door open or something. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we should dig into some of these games. We have a few. We have quite a few on the list this week. Yeah. You want to talk about Monster Hunter? We can start with Monster Hunter, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, so Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak came out. <laughs> as, as you said, it is it's kind of an expansion or like a significant update to Monster Hunter Rise, which came out uh, God, was it just last year. I have so just lost track of what's going on in Monster Hunter at this point. And I think that that's very clear <laughs> just from how I've been consuming Monster Hunter Sunbreak. I feel like I've barely played it since it came out, but I kind of still just want to chat about it for whatever reason. It's been a very weird week with Monster Hunter. <laughs> you've barely played Rise since it came out, or you've not really dabbled too well, much so in there? I played quite a bit of Rise, Okay, which I hadn't really... Like, they've been releasing updates for it since it came out so every few months there would be like new monsters or new quests you could take on and getting back into it to make sure i was all caught up for sunbreak i realized i had just not done 90 percent of that (laughs) so i started it up because i wanted to make sure like okay have i done the requisite quests so i can do all the new stuff once it launches and it turns out i had which was good but then i also had just had pages and pages of these new quests and i was just like what is this like this the thing hasn't even come out yet but there's all this new stuff and then i remembered oh yeah i kind of you know dropped off playing that game while they were still releasing all these updates so it's like oh i guess i could work on some of this stuff while i'm waiting for the game to come out right but there's a lot of it but but i feel like i don't know it got to the point where i just i'm like is this expansion for me am i still the target audience for this thing because I'm a Monster Hunter fan. At least, at least I was at one point. <laughs> a super fan at one point, if I remember correctly. It was, uh, yeah. it was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, and I was really into uh, the PSP one. Yeah. And then, uh, as it turns out, I've just been like progressively less enthralled with each new one that comes out. Probably because you know I, I played tons and tons of Monster Hunter at this point. And as exciting as they are whenever a new one comes out, they're like largely the same yeah. it's the same kind of deal like a uh, big monsters show up and you go fight them and you know the monsters change every time but it's still the same structure you just like go out and you fight a boss and then you come back and you hang out in the village for a little bit and then when you're ready you go out and fight the next boss but uh getting into this after i made sure i was all prepared i was just trying to figure out like okay so what's what's actually new in this one and it's sort of like there's a pretty standard list of stuff. Of course, they have some new monsters. There are some new maps you can fight them in. They've added a bunch of new abilities for each weapon. So, you know, coming back to it, there's like new stuff for veteran players to pick up even. But just sort of in line with me being less enthralled with each new one that comes out. It's like, oh, it feels like it should be a, a bigger event than how I'm receiving it. It feels like it should be like a huge expansion launch. I mean, you're not obligated to play these things, DJ. You're not required by law. Right, right. But I feel like I, I sort of owe it to Monster Hunter <laughs> to check out the new stuff. I'm just like, oh, what's going on in this one? Because I, I actually really liked Rise. I liked it much more than Monster Hunter World from a few years ago. Rise, just to, for me to sort of like make sense of this in my brain, Rise was kind of the Switch exclusive one that came out not terribly long ago. You said last year, right? It's the one you and I played the demo of together? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. you loved right. it. Gotcha. Oh, it, yeah, it was fantastic. <laughs> yeah, just huge, just converted into a super fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I went back and, and hunted all the monsters after that. Oh, yeah, yeah. People still tell the stories to this day. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the Switch version. Eventually it came out on Steam. But yeah, I thought it was really good. I really liked sort of the changes. 
they made from world even though it was like very much in the world format but um kind of took it a step like a, a few steps backward in terms of just how connected and kind of like persistent world felt uh which i actually kind of liked so like uh because world is very much one of those service games whereas you know events every weekend and daily challenges and that yeah kind of stuff. they would do like the live events so like you know, this one is active for the next two weeks, and then it goes away, and then the next event pops up at some point. And I uh, wasn't as much of a fan of that, but this one felt like, it felt to some degree more like the older Monster Hunter games, like the, the portable ones. Gotcha. So yeah, I was a huge fan of it, but I don't know, eventually I just played enough of it and moved on to other stuff while content was still coming out. Mm-hmm. But, but decided to jump into this one. So like I was saying, yeah, it's got the new monsters, new maps and everything. It's kind of like a new locale in that uh, when Monster Hunter Rise came out, it was in this sort of like Japanese-inspired mountain village. And all the monsters, or a majority of the the new monsters, were inspired by like Japanese yokai, which I thought was very cool. It's like, oh, this is kind of unique. This hasn't been done in Monster Hunter before. Uh, it was kind of an interesting twist on all the new monsters. In Sunbreak, they've moved on from that village and it takes place like the main staging area is this kind of old, like more European style castle. It's actually, so it's populated by, uh, in, in Rise, there was this one NPC in the village who was like the trader from some distant land. And uh, <laughs> she had this very different looking, like her whole appearance is a very different style than everybody else in this Japanese village. So it's basically like you're hanging out with her people now. So kind of a uh-huh. big change in scenery, which is an interesting way to connect the two. It's the mon- Monster Hunter connected universe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And instead of the yokai this time, what they've done is uh, there's like these three new sort of flagship monsters. And I did double take when I saw this, but instead of being based on like Japanese mythical beasts and everything, they're more or less modeled after like these universal Hollywood monsters. What? So there's one, there's like a Frankenstein one. There's a, a vampire. What? And uh, what's the, it's like a werewolf. I mean, it doesn't really look like Frankenstein. Well, I mean, it kind of does. He's got like a big kind of square jaw. You know, just like the big green, like Hollywood Frankenstein. Yeah. And then, yeah, I think it just, like they got a Dracula and a werewolf monster. And I was just like, well, this, yeah. this is weird, guys. I don't know how you guys came up with this one. Not licensed, I presume. No, no it's not actually like, yeah. you know, fight Frankenstein. But they're very like loosely inspired by uh, these classic monsters, which I thought, well, sure. Sure, why not? I mean, it, it feels a little bit silly to me, but it's a video game, so who cares? Mm-hmm. But I was just kind of sad that we were leaving that little Japanese village behind and all the yokai monsters, because I thought those were very cool. Uh, why yeah, I'm looking at these and well, some of them just look like kind of generic dragons. You can definitely see some of the influence now that you say, and the Wolfman one is a little on the nose, but yeah, I mean it's just a big yeah. wolf, right? So, so yeah. I, don't, I don't know if he transforms into a human at any point. Interesting. Yeah, so interesting direction there. Yeah, not hugely into it, but whatever. I'm down to check out a new Monster Hunter for, for a little bit. But anyway, so I started playing this. And just I was just trying to read up on all the other new stuff that's uh, included in this update. And it makes me feel like, obviously, this is designed for veterans of Monster Hunter Rise who have completed the whole thing and have more or less maxed out their characters and are ready for the next challenge. And I, just getting into it, I'm just slowly realizing, like, oh, I don't know if I did any of that. I mean, I completed all the quests, <laughs> but I certainly wasn't at the point where I was like, oh, there's nothing left for me to do in this game and i'm just you know steamrolling every monster that i come across at this point so i'm looking for the next thing but this happens so often as i was just trying to get oriented like i went to the new sort of castle base and started talking to the npcs there and they just start explaining all the new systems to me and uh one of the first things they tell you is you go to the blacksmith and they're like oh so we gotta we can make a bunch of new more powerful weapons for you but bad news, we're going to take all those advanced, like, rampage skills off your weapons. Rampage skills were something you could get, uh, or something you could, like, augment your old weapons with in Monster Hunter Rise. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, well, <laughs> I don't have any of those. So, you know, <laughs> no skin off my back. Go ahead and do what you need to do. <laughs> and it just feels like there are so many of these features that are catering specifically to people who are like, you know, the the top 1% of Monster Hunter players at that point. Probably not the, you know, the top 1%, but just like the pretty elite group of Monster Hunter players. Mm-hmm. Where, uh, yeah, it feels like it's maybe not the thing for just people who play Monster Hunter Rise for a few months and then drop off while they're still in the middle of releasing content. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I've done a few of the intro quests. Um, I, I have not even fought any of those, um, the like the Hollywood inspired monsters yet. I've just been trying to get my equipment and everything up to a level where you know it's it's not going to be incredibly painful because all the new quests are like this whole new tier of difficulty above what was in Rise. And it's yeah, you know, it's been fun because I I enjoy Monster Hunter, so it's fun coming back to it and just like grinding out some bosses for a while. But. Uh, the funniest thing to me, though, is like one of the monsters they brought back for this one is just there's this big crab boss from it's actually from uh, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, which is the PSP one that I probably played the most. So oh, I was I like, you. oh, all right, I got my crab back in here. I'm just going to, you know, pull out my sword and fight this crab like it's 2010 again. And we'll just do this for a while. And on top of that, the area, or one of the new areas they added in the game is also from Freedom Unite. So it's just like this, well, this is strangely familiar, booting up this new Monster <laughs> Hunter expansion in 2022. I'm just like fighting endless, you know, streams of these crabs again and building that same armor set that I had back on the PSP. But uh, I'm kind of fine with that. I'll make my way over to the new monsters at some point, but uh, it's just been a weirdly nostalgic experience. Is that in general what, uh, and I'm asking you to sort of like speak on behalf of the Monster Hunter community, <laughs> which is, uh, I, I understand the folly of that, but like, is that what fans want? Like, do you know, do, do people who play modern Monster Hunter games wish there was, you know, retro maps and retro monsters, or do you want new stuff all the time? I think there'll always be a, a portion of it. Like, you, you want some amount of familiar stuff to come back, but... I think you also, you, most of it you want to be new, right? There was actually some controversy leading up to release where somebody, I think, had data mined the entire list of new monsters. I think they like figured it out from some files in the demo that came out. And they were sharing this list around and comparing it to previous Monster Hunter expansions and just like the base games as well. And there was all this doom and gloom about, oh, you know, this game has X number of monsters, which is wide fewer than the previous expansion so what's the deal capcom <laughs> and i just thought this is silly i mean this is probably how you can tell monster hunter's gone completely mainstream at this point where you have people just whining about completely insane stuff like this on reddit mm-hmm. because i was i was looking at the list and i was just like well this seems like a lot of monsters i don't know how you had like the minimum number of monsters you need to qualify <laughs> as a worthwhile monster hunter expansion but people are going to complain no matter how many monsters are in the game. They're just not going to be right, satisfied. Yeah. It's never enough monsters. Right, right. And it's not like, I mean, there's a mix of sort of classic monsters and sort of variants of existing monsters. Maybe that was the thing they got hung up on. Because sometimes they'll just bring back monsters and be like, oh, this one is it's much scarier than the previous forms of this monster that you fought. <laughs> so enjoy that. But I don't know. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I always wonder, oh, you know, how much sort of retro content is necessary if it's, you know, if, if the Monster Hunter community just wants to sort of revisit the same stuff they've done in the past, but make it sort of, but now make it HD or whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm never sure sort of like, you know, what what needs to sort of be the headline about new Monster Hunter DLC that would make this community super excited and happy? Yeah, well, I think it's just way more new monsters, I suppose. Yeah. They didn't add any new weapons or anything. They haven't added any weapons to a Monster Hunter game in a while, actually. Oh, really? But uh, there was actually one that came out a few years ago, uh, Monster Hunter Generations, which was largely, like, that was the idea, because you would actually go back to previous Monster Hunter villages and fight monsters from previous games. 
So that was like very nostalgia focused. And I, right. I find myself thinking sometimes like, oh, why don't I just go back and play that one? <laughs> because there are, <laughs> you know, there are a lot more of the monsters that I was familiar with in that game. And of course, I like all the yeah. old areas. They're very familiar. But Monster Hunter greatest hits. Yeah, that's I mean, that's more or less what it was, uh, which is very cool. Uh, although I do like a lot of the sort of gameplay improvements that they've made in Rise and, and even World before it, because it, it feels much more modern and much more accessible, even to somebody like me who's been playing since the PSP days. Yeah. Is it also sort of fair for me to, like, theorize that World was kind of the first Monster Hunter game that had a huge audience, right? Oh, I mean, it these things were generally was. yeah. Okay. In general, Monster Hunter games were not, like the big headlining like triple a juggernaut release of the of the season historically yeah uh until rise they were I mean, until world right world sorry excuse me yeah world, yeah right. no that's definitely true i mean they were they were definitely picking up an audience yeah since the psp like the on 3ds and you know, even the the wii u uh, as it is not indie games was. by any stretch but it still very much sort of felt like a bit of a niche thing. yeah but now i mean it's absolutely just a mainstream thing and like tons of people are playing it did it? I mean, did it not win like Game of the Year at uh, at Game Awards or something like that a couple of years ago? Or the, I think World might have. I don't. I don't think there is a Game Awards. DJ. <laughs> There's no Game Awards. Oh well, I must. Nah, that's not. That's not a thing that exists. must have just imagined that. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy to read headlines about it now and think back, like you know, just a little over ten years ago, where I felt like. Oh, somebody please get on, you know, ad hoc party on their PS3 and <laughs> play the <this> stupid <laughs> multiplayer game with me cuz I uh, couldn't even really take it online. Uh, oh, that's funny. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Everything everybody sells out eventually. <laughs> everybody sells Monster out. Monster Hunter's turn. I mean, I feel like yeah. I don't think they've sold out at this point. I'm I'm thrilled that they're doing so well, but uh I don't know. I feel a little overwhelmed with it at times cuz I'll I'll sign on to the Reddit or the subreddit or whatever. And everybody is just so like, oh man, did you see the news on the latest data mine? And they're just speculating over what other monsters they might add. And you know, somebody's got a spreadsheet of all the attack damage from the demo that they've they've mined out. And I just like, oh wow, oh boy, this is a lot, guys. I don't think I need uh, <laughs> quite this level of detail on uh, the new yeah. Monster Hunter stuff. Does anybody just play Monster Hunter for fun anymore? <laughs> right. Yeah. So. I'm taking a very weird approach to playing Sunbreak. Like, I'll, I'll probably get to those Frankenstein monsters at some point, but uh, <laughs> I'm completely content to just kill a bunch of crabs and, you know, other monsters that, I've, like, the same monsters I've been killing for the last 10 years. Sure. Well, I mean, the good news is that it services both of those types of players, right? I mean, there's, there's, you're, you're getting something out of this that uh, um, maybe doesn't appeal to another person who picked this up, but they have new content to look forward to as well. True, true. All things to all people. That's Monster Hunter. Yes. Yeah. The, that's <laughs> definitely what they say about Monster Hunter. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, kind of a weird, like, semi update on this thing. Maybe I'll talk yeah. more about it later when I get more into it. Maybe I'll just kill crabs for 100 hours. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Is this where the video game meme giant enemy crab comes from? Oh, no. That's from, uh, that was that old PS3 game. Oh, okay. Although, wait. I'm trying to think if Monster Hunter predated that game. I think it was, it probably didn't, but it was real close. Actually, the, so there was a Monster Hunter on PS2. I have to look up whether the crab was in that one or not. Okay, we can come back to that. Okay, yeah. Live. Somebody will do a yeah. whole, you know, retrospective on giant enemy crabs in video games. Oh, I'm sure it's out there. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. So what have you been up to? You want to talk about this play date thing, got, or are you want to save that? I got this cool little play date, yeah. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, play date is a new video game console. It's a little handheld portable device. Um, it looks like a tiny little kind of credit card sized Game Boy, essentially. <laughs> it's bright yellow. It's got a um, tiny little black and white screen mm -hmm. that is not backlit. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my first experience was it was just trying to get the lighting right in my living room so I could see what the hell I was looking <laughs> at. They're not selling like I'm a like, worm ah. light for this thing. To the best of my knowledge, that doesn't exist yet, but I'm sure somebody's working oh, on it. Oh, man. Yeah. 
but uh yeah it's um uh, i've not played a, a, a console a video game console that has a screen quite like this in a long time so i was not prepared for just how dark it is mm. but it's uh it's cool it's this tiny little thing it's got a, a d-pad and um, um we got an a b button uh, the weird hook here the weird little extra feature is it has a crank that flips out of the side of it um it nestles sort of in the body of the device, but you can flip it up and it turns into like a fishing rod reel mm-hmm. type of thing. Oh man, how many fishing games have people made for this? <laughs> uh, I've not encountered one and yeah, I've, uh, um, I, I'm, I imagine it's out there somewhere. Uh, I, there's a part of my brain that's sort of like Animal Crossing, Animal Crossing. <laughs> um, but uh, it seems unlikely that would ever happen. But yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it's cool. It's kind of a weird, fun little uh, device. It came out, uh, it's been sort of, uh, um, uh, what, announced for quite a while now. I think 2018 uh, was the first time it sort of popped up. It was developed by Panic, who up to this point has been a video game developer and publisher. Mm-hmm. Um, they published Firewatch. They published the Untitled Goose Game. Um, so this, to the best of my knowledge, is their first foray into, uh, foray into making a, um, a console, making a device, a consumer good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's cool. It's a cool little toy that does a lot of weird things. It's certainly not trying to be the next Switch or PlayStation 5. It's occupying its old little weird indie game space. And it's a cool like sort of platform for kind of championing indie games because the, the format they're using for getting new games is a subscription uh, where basically with the cost of the device, which is $179, you get a season of games they're calling it mm-hmm. and it's two new video games for your play date every Monday for 12 weeks. So 24 games total automatically delivered to you via Wi-Fi. So <laughs> I've had the, the pleasure for the last two weeks of waking up on Monday morning and seeing the little white light on the top of my play date blinking, um, which means I have cool new games waiting for me. Mm. And there's a fun little process where you kind of click on the thing and it's like a little gift wrapped package. Uh, and little robot hands come out of the screen and unwrap the bow. And it pops they come open. out of the <laughs> screen. Oh, they're just, they're just on the screen. Uh, on the screen. Okay. Yeah, sorry. They don't come out of the screen. Uh, and it adds two new games to your uh, to your menu, to your home screen. So, yeah, it's a cool little Wi-Fi connected device. Um, and uh, uh, it doesn't have a shop on it yet, although they say there is like a catalog feature coming. Mm-hmm. But they are selling um, video games you can play in a, or buy in addition to uh, the ones that are part of your subscription on the Playdate website. Yeah, um, yeah. There's free games that you can also sideload uh, from the website. And itch.io and the Playdate subreddit are full of <laughs> little kind of like, you know, handcrafted, lovingly assembled indie games or tech demos or fun little experiences. There's one that just popped up today. Somebody sort of dropped into the subreddit for Playdate that is uh, basically a uh, paper airplane flying to- toy um, where uh, you use the little crank to to fly a paper airplane for a little while, and that's the whole thing. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, yeah, it, I, it's kind of an interesting, you know, if you make video games, if you want to make a cool little video game and you don't want to make Monster Hunter Rise as your first video game development experience, this is a cool little platform for that as well. Hmm. And the Panic folks have lined up a bunch of, um, you know, kind of interesting video game developers for their first season of games that uh, that they're sharing. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, some interesting stuff to kind of look forward to there in the pipeline. Have they said um, what's next? Like, are they doing a second season of games after this first one is out? They have not announced that yet. I think that's kind of the interesting question is like, you know, uh, what is the future of this thing? <laughs> Does it, um, yeah, will there be another season of 24 games to subscribe to? Will, you know, will they just turn the shop feature on and from that point forward, all the games that you sort of can get are a la carte? Hmm. Um, is it pay only? I, I, I don't, you know, nobody knows. So, uh, and Panic has not said yet. Um, it only just came out in April. So they're still kind of serving games to people. Mm-hmm. And, and no matter when you get it, you start with the same two games on the first week and the same two games on your second week. So the fact that it came out in April and I got mine in June, let's say, I don't get all the games that came out in those three months. Yeah, um, that was surprising it, to me a week. when I heard that. Cause yeah, me too. I think, I don't think I was alone in this either. Was when they announced that they were doing the subscription model with weekly releases, that it would just be like, okay, 
first week of June, these are the two games that everybody gets. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool, at least, because then, you know, for the next week or so, everybody's just going to be talking about these two games. But no, it's like, it's based on your schedule, essentially. Right. Yeah. Which, I don't know how I feel about that. I guess it would be weird if they just started releasing all these games and people were still waiting on their backordered playdates for, for months, but... Yeah, I think it is, unfortunately, it seems to be a side effect of them not having enough devices to meet all the orders yeah, <laughs> at once. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I see the value, the immense value, and, and well, that's like Wordle, right? Or like the New York Times crossword puzzles. Everybody's working on the same thing at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get to kind of have a, a like a community conversation about it, at least in that little brief window. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's not the way that this first season of games is working out for the play date. <laughs> we're, we're all kind of, we're getting them in the same order, but we're all getting them at very different times because mm-hmm. we're all getting our play dates at different times. It's kind of weird because now somebody will just be like, oh, I love this game that came out this, this week on my play date. You can check it out three months from now when uh, you get caught <laughs> yeah, up. In a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah, we, we actually had a very similar conversation in our Discord um, because one of the members of our, our Discord community, Arcasa, got her play date weeks and weeks ago. Um, and she was saying, oh, you're really going to like the one that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And it's unfortunately <laughs> still like three weeks right. away from me. <laughs> so uh, I, I I will be excited when it comes, but it's not here yet. So, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, I'm I, I, There's a part of me that sort of wants the Netflix solution where I want all the games right now. God damn it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but I also like that, like I said, waking up on Monday morning and seeing the little blinking white LED on the top of my play date and knowing I have two new games to play with. Yeah. Um, I like yeah. that too, because otherwise you just be, you know, probably play each one for like 30 seconds before trying to move on to the next thing. Yeah. I mean, 24 games is a lot to process, even if they are little kind of bite-sized experiences, if they dropped all 24 of them on me at, at one time or, or whatever, up to this point, you know, mm-hmm. 15, 12, something like that. Um, it's still, yeah, a lot to process. So at the very least, sort of serving two a week to everybody gets you to really kind of maybe spend you know, a little bit of time with those two games before you move on to the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that I've done so far, the two, um, the week one games are Whitewater Wipeout and Casual Birder. Mm. Um, well, it's your birding game. Whitewater Wipeout. Asking for for the it last is, two years. It is very much the birding game I've been looking forward to. Yeah. Um, so Casual Birder is a, 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 a fun little like. I don't know. Yeah, it's a bird watching game, essentially. Um, you are uh, a new resident in a town called Birdtown, um, where everybody in town is very obsessed with bird watching. Okay. And there's a, um, a, a little competition going um, for taking pictures of uh, rare and exotic birds. There is the most exotic legendary bird that is supposed to be sort of roosting in town right now. Mm. So you'll, yeah, you have a little character who you move around from screen to screen and uh, you'll hear an interesting little bird chirp or some strange noise or rustling in the bushes. Um, And you have to figure out how to sort of lure that bird out of hiding, be it with acorns or worms or some other little collectible or or pickup that you found someplace else. Um, So you're trying to sort of match the, the bait essentially or the lure with the bird. Um, and you talk to different villagers and talk to other people who are also trying to take pictures of birds and stuff like that. Um, and, and when you get the opportunity, when you've lured the mysterious critter out of hiding, um, you hit a button and it brings up what looks like a cell phone <laughs> on your tiny little black and white screen. And you use the hand crank on the side of the play date to focus. Oh, good. Um, good. Yep. So you kind of dial it in, dial in a little bit and you kind of find just the right sweet spot, snap the most perfect picture. Um, and, uh, it adds it to your little photo library and you get to, uh, um, I don't know, cherish that memory forever, I guess. <laughs> um, the next two there's weeks, a whole subplot so about, oh, sorry, for the right. next week. <laughs> well, yeah. there's a little subplot about, um, uh, maybe somebody has, uh, uh kidnapped the mysterious legendary bird. Oh. Um, maybe there's some nefarious bird watchers in town that you need to watch out for. So you're also trying to solve a little bit of a mystery. It's cute. It's funny. Some of the writing is very funny. Um, it's, yeah, it's just a fun little kind of slight experience that, uh, um, makes pretty good use of, of what the play date does. <laughs> Has every game just been incredibly like crank centric? I mean, it, wait, how many of these do you have so far? <laughs> uh, so far I have six. I've really only played two and I'm sure okay. I wouldn't try to review six games yeah, on yeah, the yeah, show yeah. right now anyway. So, um, uh, so I figured I would kind of tackle them by week. Okay. Um, 
The other one is Whitewater Wipeout, which is very crank centric. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that is a basically a surfing score attack game um, where you start the game paddling out on a surfboard, hop up, and then you use the crank and the face buttons to do a bunch of tricks. You sort of ride up on the wave, you spin the crank to do little spins in the air on your surfboard, you try to land it just right. The wave continues to, you know, grow. You try to sort of do tricks and stay on your board as long as possible without wiping out. Um, and it's leaderboard driven. So you get a score at the oh. end. It pulls up a leaderboard that it pulls off the Internet where you get to compare your scores with other uh, other Playdate owners. Um, and uh, yeah, lather, rinse, repeat. I find it less fun <laughs> than casual <laughs> burner. Uh, it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, very frustrating. I, I don't stay on my surfboard for very long. And uh, I, I feel like the, the crank's a little fidgety. It feels like it's it's super easy to kind of over crank. And I feel like a lot of the times I'm trying to pull off some very fancy trick. Oh, yeah. Um, or, you know, or do a 360 or something crazy like that and end up just wiping out because I've I've uh, I've cranked it a little too aggressively, I guess. <laughs> oh, just, um, so I see people on Twitter game. and on the, the leaderboards putting up just huge scores like 30,000 points uh, and I'm tapping out somewhere, you know, around five or 6,000. Yeah, <laughs> so um, yeah, maybe not the biggest fan of whitewater wipeout, but it's cool. I mean, it's kind of fun, you know, but I'm generally not the type of person who's going to play a, a score attack. Like, Oh, I must have the high score. I must be number mm -hmm, one on the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not generally driven by that. Wait until they put a leaderboard in that bird watching game. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. Give me some high scores on the bird watching game. Yeah. I'd be that guy. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, those are the first two, Whitewater Wipeout and Casual Birder. Uh, interesting, I actually just learned this tonight, the Whitewater Wipeout game is uh, is by the same developer who's doing that, um, oh, what is it called? Golf or Die or whatever it is, oh, yeah. the, 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 the golfing. Golf the afterlife, um, whatever it is. Yeah, that's coming out, I think it's supposed to come out this year too. It's, it's This was their first um, little release here for the play date, and then that other game, that golfing roguelike is coming out for everything i think okay uh, i was gonna yeah. ask if it was whether or not it was hironobu sakaguchi the creator of final fantasy because for a while he was making those xbox rpgs and then he like moved to hawaii and just started surfing a lot and then made all these surfing mobile games <laughs> just like oh, oh really is this guy just <laughs> still making surfing games that's wild no yeah. no to the best of my knowledge it's not no I don't know who the developer on Casual Birder is. I Googled their name and, and basically it just took me to a video game developer's Twitter. Uh, oh. I have more followers than they do. So oh. <laughs> when's your play uh, day game coming out? <laughs> right, exactly. No, I uh, I just, you know, not, not not to disparage video game developers by any stretch. It's just, uh, um, you know, I, it, it, this is not, a you know, a headliner name, a video game developer that uh, I had ever heard of or, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to dig myself out of this hole now that I've said it out loud. So, <laughs> with apologies well, to the I, developer well, of Casual Birder. I think you just have to make a Playdate game. Yeah, I must have to. How hard could it be? There are only like two buttons on it. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I've heard it's a, you know, pretty uh, accessible from a development standpoint. The simple fact that, you know, there's all this stuff on Itch and Twitter and on the Playdate website that you could just sideload to it. Mm -hmm. Um with a USB cable uh, is probably a testament to uh, how accessible it is from a developer standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how you would go about doing that. You need a play date dev kit or something. I don't know the answer to that. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, so it's cool. It's a cool little toy. Um, it's this fun little pocket size thing. I just keep throwing it in my bag and every time I get a couple of minutes, I'll play a few more minutes of casual birder or, for a little while was sort of like futzing around with the whitewater wipeout game. Uh, uh, since I've gotten a couple of other games here, I've, I've played a bit more with those. We'll talk about in, in future episodes of the podcast here, but oh, yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's kind of two more games every week from here on out. Maybe we'll see how it goes. Yeah. All right, excellent. Um, but the, you know, if, if they're, uh, if they're appeal to me, if they're fun to talk about, I don't want to get on here and slack about video All right, games yeah. if I don't like the thing that they made, but <laughs> real um, awkward week. And just, just one play game, uh, play date game this week. <laughs> the other one I shall not talk about. You know who you are. Yeah. You know what you did. <laughs> um, uh. Yeah, it's um, it's cool. It's a fun little device. I've, I've, I, 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 I like the hardware more than I like the games thus far. <laughs> so I keep waiting for like, what's the killer app? What's the thing that, like, oh, I see, I see your value now, Playdate. Yeah, I see. this is what the crank. This was is for. the thing. 
Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple coming up that I've read a bit about. There's the one that Arcasa promised that's a few weeks away. Um, uh, there's, you know, all over the subreddit and stuff like that. There's people talking about, you know, this is the game. This is the best one so far. There's, oddly enough, there's a version of Tetris that you can sideload. Mm-hmm. You and I were talking briefly about it before the show, and, and we're both theorizing that you use the crank to spin the Tetramino. So if it doesn't do that, I'd be very disappointed. You know, it'd be amazing if it spun the entire well instead. <laughs> that would be like oh man not what we were expecting yeah. not at all no um so yeah i'll i'll check that out i'll sideload a few of these uh, um i think polygon had a list of like oh you must sideload these five games uh to your play date so well, maybe work through some of that stuff and chime in on those or in the future in, in, in upcoming episodes of the show here right, excellent let me know when they have vampire yeah. survivors for it and i'll check it out <laughs> i'll let you know um, so the, 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 I guess the downside here for this thing is if you order a play date right now, if this appeals to you, if you've never heard of a play date before and you want one, um, you're going to have to wait until 2023. If you order it today, Ugh. you will not see one of these things for a year, probably. So it's a little disappointing that they're not more accessible, uh, and, uh but you know, yeah. at least it gives them a little more time to get some of these other features going, maybe get that shop out. Um, and uh, figure out what they're going to do for season two. Yeah, it'd be nice if, you know, by the time that's ready, if they've ramped up production a little more so they are more readily available. Because, yeah, I, I think, like, I'm... I don't know if I need one of these things, but if it turns out there are enough interesting games on it, I could see myself getting one, but it would, I think I would be frustrated just kind of getting reset back to week one and uh, having to wade through all these other games to get to the really interesting ones that come out later. Not that the early ones are yeah. not interesting, but you know, if somebody releases a really cool game like, like a month from now, I'm just going to have to tack that <laughs> on to like, okay, first I got to wait for this thing to ship, and then I just got to wait like four more months to actually get, get the game downloaded. Yeah. Yeah. I also don't know sort of the viability of this thing for like bigger gaming experiences. The, the, the stuff that I've played thus far feels very, like I said, kind of slight, kind of like a toy, kind of like a, you know, a brief experience. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm going to play a hundred hour RPG on my play date. Mm-hmm. That seems like a lot to mm-hmm. ask. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I, again, I, I don't know who's making games for this thing or what sort of is to come uh, in the future, but, uh, uh it, it seems sort of unlikely that, uh, this would be a place to sort of drop, you know, the next dragon quest or something like that. I, I don't know if that's ever going to be in the play dates future. Yeah. I was going to say, or if it's really, that doesn't seem like quite like the spirit of game they're looking for for this, but also I'm sure somebody on itch will just make that anyway. Yes, there's that as well. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, that's a cool thing about it being sort of so accessible and so easy to develop for that. I imagine you're probably going to (laughs) get some, maybe some illicit bootleg stuff on there at some point or another. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, Um, Exciting that you finally got one in your hands. Yeah. Uh, I ordered it last July, so this was oh, a, a journey, 11, 11 months in the making. So I, I was very, very happy when I got the shipment notification of it nice. um, making its way to me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool with it. Looking forward to playing some more of the uh, games in the coming weeks. And uh, I will report back if there's anything super noteworthy. Cool. Yeah. You and I also checked out the demo for Live Alive this week, which yes. dropped on the Switch just recently. Um, I think that was one of the sort of the the headlines from that Nintendo direct last week as well. Yeah. Um, I had not heard of this game prior to it sort of recently being announced, but it is, I guess my understanding that this is a remake of an old Nintendo game. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, very old super Nintendo game did not come out outside of Japan. Uh, I was shocked by the way, when they showed this in the <laughs> Nintendo direct, uh, cause I'm like shocked. I tell you, I'm like <laughs> fairly familiar. I mean, I'm not that familiar with it, but I, like, I've heard of it. I've listened to the soundtrack a bunch of times, but like they started showing off this trailer and I was like, I, I don't know what this is. And then the way like they reveal like the text on the screen, they did it in a way that was like very clearly aping sort of the logo. And I was just like, there is no way that that's what this is. And then it just cuts to the live <laughs> alive with, Live Alive? Yeah. Live Alive logo. And my jaw was just on the floor. Like, I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> but I'm super excited because for the longest time, this was just one of those weird sort of lost Japanese square RPGs that didn't get localized. 
but now they have just decided, you know, 2022 is the year to do it. Yeah. And they're not only giving it an English localization, they're giving it the whole sort of, um, what do they call it, like HD 2D treatment, sort of like um, Octopath Traveler and Triangle Strategy, uh, and that you know, Dragon Quest remake, which will come out at some point. Yeah, where everything looks like kind of this, the tilt shift with like the perimeter being kind of fuzzy. Yeah, but it's all pixel graphics and yeah. Yeah, and I feel like every with every new version of this that comes out, they continue to just tone down that effect, which is like, okay, yes, we're finally getting to a place where you can like stand to look at these things for more than thirty seconds at a time. <laughs> so I, Octopath was a lot. Yes, it was like a lot. <laughs> that was very clearly yeah. like, oh, we just invented this thing, and we want to make sure everybody knows how cool it looks. And it was just like I feel like I you know got cataracts or something. After playing this game, <laughs> but I feel like this one—it it still is a—it's maybe a little dialed up farther than I would like it, but it, it looks pretty good in general. Yeah, I think so too. It's a very pretty looking pixel game. Yeah, I—I yeah. I don't know if this is like the same team that's working on all of these, but yeah, I feel like developers in general are getting a, a hang on or a handle on how to use this sort of style of presentation. So that's very cool. And yeah, like the pixel art is great. Like I said, I'm not incredibly familiar with the original one. I feel like probably the sprites you see in this were like based closely on the original sprite art, if not just directly pulled from it and probably cleaned up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But visually, it, it looks really amazing. Like the, the HD 2D looks good. What really caught me off guard was whenever you bring up the menu, which is just like your typical sort of status menu in any RPG you get sort of the, the usual menu items, but they're all sort of overlaid on top of this little vignette of uh, like the character you're playing as in some sort of scenery, which is just, oh, that's a very fancy looking menu. <laughs> Usually I just expect a bunch of blue boxes or something. Right. Uh, but the premise of this is, and like I didn't even know what this game was about until I started reading up on the remake, is you play one of actually you play more than one but there are it's like seven rpgs in one essentially and they all take place in different time periods starring different characters and i believe they like somehow come together later on but uh like i haven't been reading up too much on it because i don't want to spoil myself yeah which is that sounds a lot like octopath Traveler. <laughs> yeah it does but they you know they just decided <laughs> they needed one more character <laughs> Septic travel. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a super cool premise, and especially like you load it up and you're presented with like the seven characters, and it gives you a little like brief explanation of what's going on in the time period and sort of what you can expect. And each period ranges from this like a, a prehistoric setting to a couple of like sort of medieval Asia settings. There's like a um, imperial Japan. Or no, you know, Imperial China, and then China, yeah, right, the, yeah. a Japanese one later on. There's a Wild West one, like a cowboy one, which I thought was yeah. kind of an interesting. That's not a thing you see in RPGs very often. Yeah. No, yeah, that was also very cool. And then there's just a few that take place sort of in space or in the near future, yeah. which is like <laughs> in the near future and well. a, dis a distant future. Yeah, yeah. So pretty fun premise for a game. Very creative. You can play as three or you can play three of these in the demo uh you play like the first hour of uh three different scenarios and we were able to get into a few of them yeah yeah i played the um imperial china one and i played the uh a bit of the distant future one yeah um yeah i played all three but i did not finish the uh the japanese one i felt like oh. uh, at some at some point well i'll I can get into it, but uh, I, I took a yeah. break from that one to go play the distant future one because that, that sounded interesting as well. And the cool thing about the demo, um, for our listeners' sake and for my time and your time, is that any of your progress from the demo carries over to the full game should you pick it up. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you uh, don't want to play the demo because you don't want to waste your time having to play through the same stuff over and over again, uh, your progress saves in three different little save slots and will carry into the main game should you decide to spring forward. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, I like that. I love it when they do that in demos. <laughs> I think that's a, a smart way to get me to demo your game. Yeah. Um, Although in this case, yeah. I felt like each scenario was brisk enough that I probably wouldn't mind too much having to replay all of them. 
Yeah, I mean, you're not putting hours and hours into these, so that's a good news, too. Yeah, yeah they're also, like, just the way some of these scenarios were designed, also, I, I felt like maybe I should just replay them, like, when the full game comes out, because I did not really know what I was doing for, <laughs> for several of them. <laughs> it also felt like there were opportunities where you could potentially have, like, an impact on how the like which direction the plot was going in i'm not totally clear if that is the case but it, it definitely felt like it a few times yeah i well i was in the um in the imperial china one you are a a, a kung fu shifu who is looking for a disciple yeah someone to pass their kung fu along to um and in the you know in the in the process of 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 searching for a, a student, essentially, um, you will encounter a couple of people who you're like, would you, do you wish to take this person on as your disciple? Um, and I always sort of felt like I didn't have the opportunity, you know, you're given the no <laughs> opportunity. And I'm like, well, I'm going to say no this one time. Mm -hmm. um, and then that character later, like stops me on the road and begs me. Oh yeah. Please yeah. let me be. Yeah. <laughs> and then you don't really have a choice. So I'm like, is it sort of the illusion of choice or am I really sort of charting, you know, can I do this in a different way than, than other people playing it? I, I'm not sure uh, sort of what kind of sort of choice driven game this is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I feel like it may be more like for the illusion of choice, but uh, we'll see how the other scenarios unfold. Yeah. Um, but uh, combat is, is you know, a fairly standard kind of tactical turn-based affair where you have a, a, a menu of, of attacks that you can do um, and everything's on a grid. Uh, and, you know, you basically shuffle through your different characters and, and choose some attack, move them around in some sort of advantageous way. And, and hopefully you'll, you know, do more damage to them before they do to you. Yeah, I think the, the combat is, seems really interesting. Uh, like you said, it's, it's it looks sort of like a tactics game, but it's all, it's it's not quite like XCOM or Final Fantasy tactics style. It, it feels like no. they put a Final Fantasy game onto a grid and it's like it's not a huge grid either it's probably like eight by eight or something like that but you just end up moving your, your guy around uh on these tiles and do these moves which all have sort of area of effect yeah tiles that they uh attack but you have free move up to the point where you attack which is kind of an interesting hook in that you're not you know uh, i think a lot of these and i've not played a ton of tactical games but they have you know you can move five spaces north or south <laughs> of um, yeah in live alive it feels like you have you basically can run around the entire map to sort of put your character in the right place um to deploy whatever attack yeah although did you realize that the the enemies are you know charging up their turns while you're doing that yes i did <laughs> okay yeah, yeah. yeah it took me a little uh, while i don't think the game because i was just like oh you could move around i'm just gonna move all around this whole thing and then i noticed like the the meter over the enemy's head is the little increasing. barb of their head is rising so exactly like, like oh okay so i should you know calm down a little bit yeah, yep. just stand in one place and hopefully it's the right place. Yeah, but uh, pretty cool battle system. I think it's it was a little difficult for me to wrap my head around because so in the the Chinese scenario you play as this like the Shifu who's like already just the grand master of kung fu, and he's <laughs> he's basically unstoppable. So I was like, okay, so all these battles just very easy. And I played a little bit of the the Japanese scenario in which you play as a, a ninja who's trying to sneak into this castle. And at the beginning of it, you're sort of encouraged, like, oh, you, you know, you decide how you want to deal with this situation. Either you can kill everybody or you can try and sneak through undetected. So I, I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. Maybe I'll try and do that. So whenever I would get into a fight, I would just, like, run away. So I didn't really fight anyone in that. So yeah. I just have these weird, these two different exposures to the battle system, one in which I was just this invincible monk, and then the other <laughs> one where I literally fought nobody. So I was trying to think like, oh, so I wonder where the the final game is going to land. Like, it's going to be sort of that old school, sort of challenging level of difficulty, or are they going to, like, have they tweaked it a little bit for this remake? It's It's very hard to tell just from playing the demo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I can only imagine, too, that there's got to be some different sort of interpretation of that combat, depending on the scenario. You know, you're not going to be doing, uh, I, I suspect you're not going to be doing punching and kicking in the Wild West. One. Right. It's right. got to be gunfights, right? So there's got to be some sort of accounting for different types of weapons and, and making sure that those things are sort of appropriate for the time period. So um, 
So yeah, there's a part of me that was sort of like, oh, if it's just me kind of beating people up again, <laughs> over and over again, I don't know if this is the game for me, but then I just sort of extrapolating that out. I'm like, well, you know, is there going to be kind of like cool laser guns and stuff like that in the sci-fi ones? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you, you maybe, don't want to play yeah, a game like where you're said. just like punching people the whole time? Uh, no, I don't. No, nope. oh, interesting. All right. Yeah. Mix it up a little bit. Give me a little variety. <laughs> well, they have punch so many people. different ways you can punch people in this, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah there was one of the things that was sort of like this this enemy uh, on their little screen below it's sort of like uh has vulnerabilities and there's a little icon of a foot and i'm like oh i can't kick this guy <laughs> yeah yeah um like, yep, better do all the hand ones i guess so uh, i don't know some of it felt a little elementary and some of it sort of felt like geez i don't know if i want to if all eight lives or seven lives in this game are going you know, to basically map out the same way where i'm doing the same you know collection of punching and kicking i don't know how fun that is but mm -hmm. I, I i presume you'd have to mix that up based on the setting yeah i think you, you'll probably get a better idea of it by playing the japanese scenario and actually i, I at this point I, I really want to go back and try fighting people just so i can figure out what's going on right uh but they also like each each section they only let you play like the very beginning in the demo so it, it feels like it's you know more or less you're getting a tutorial version of whatever the final game is going to be yeah. But I thought it was pretty cool. I had a lot of fun with it. It's um it's really interesting to see this game remade in this way. Um uh, and still like a lot of it still felt it, it had a very like sixteen bit era feel to it, but um it was like modernized at the same time. Like it, it the localization seems pretty good. The uh there's a lot of voice acting, which I thought was actually pretty good. Yeah. The, I've been very mixed on like with triangle strategy and like with sort of recent JRPGs, voice acting is kind of a hit or miss. In fact, more <laughs> frequently, it's a, a miss for me. But yeah. I was impressed by a lot of it in this. Actually, by yeah, pretty much every character does a, a great job. Uh, I turned it down. I thought it was. Oh, fine. you turned it down. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, they yeah. do take longer to read lines than it does for them to just like display it on the screen. So if you can read yeah. through them quickly, that's my take on it. And it's generally sort of been the way that I consume kind of more modern RPGs, I, I, I go back to the DS or the three, the three DS model where I can just tap the screen or hit the a button to move quickly through dialogue. Um, there was not a lot of voice acting in those early days. So, yeah. um, yeah, I was impressed anyway. Cool. Each scenario also feels, uh, like it has just the whole kind of experimental spirit throughout the whole thing. Uh, like you have, you know, these seven different storylines and each one seems like, uh, I mean, they they all have similar battles for the most part, but you end up having these really interesting, like different sort of mechanics in each one. Like the, uh, like I said, the ninja has a little stealth section, which may or may not have just been like incredibly scuffed, but it was still <laughs> kind of a unique thing to see in a game like this, especially if you consider this first came out in like mid nineties, so uh, yeah. stealth stuff wasn't quite a thing back then. Yeah. I'm intrigued by it. I am, um, uh, like I said, it's not something that was on my radar. It's certainly not a game that I've been waiting 20 years to play by any stretch. I've been waiting three months. So yeah, yeah I, I'm, uh, I'm intrigued by the concept. It's certainly very pretty looking. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I love that this sort of very old game was kind of pulled out of retirement mysteriously and dropped on the world in 2022. Um, so yeah, I want to play more of the demo and, and try to sort of figure out if this is something that I would spend what, 50 or 60 dollars on i presume mm -hmm. right yeah i'm not sure how much it is yeah i really like the idea i mean I, I again i don't know how the stories come together uh afterward if they do at all but i've seen it described as just seven different rpgs which feels like okay that's kind of an interesting approach <laughs> like maybe you don't yeah. have time to take in a 40 hour or you know god forbid a 100 hour rpg at this point just play a little <laughs> like I, I don't know how long the individual ones would be, but I imagine they'd be less than 10 hours or so each. Just a little, yeah. these little uh, short story versions of RPGs. And it seems to sort of, uh, at least in the demo, it seems to manage each life as a separate save state. So you can bounce around between them if you're, you know, you're yeah, tired yeah. of uh, Im Imperial China and want to go out to outer space for a little while and you can bounce over to a different save yeah. uh, and do that. So, uh, yeah, I, I again, I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by the thing here. Um, I just wasn't, and I didn't expect to be blown away by the demo. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I wasn't really sure what I was expecting. I was honestly just like not really expecting to play this ever. 
<laughs> so it's just a you know a nice the fact surprise that you that are that came out. exceeds expectations yeah <laughs> yeah well I, you know i thought i definitely expected it to be i expected there to be a little more like friction just by virtue of it being a, a very old game but uh yeah i had a really good time with the demo yeah yeah no it feels i uh, from dialogue and localization and interaction and stuff like that it all feels very um you know, it feels very modern. I, I, yeah. would, I would not guess that it was built on the skeleton of a much older game. Yeah, yeah. So this comes out uh, this month, right? I think a couple weeks away. Yeah, it comes out on the, the 22nd, yeah. I think. I'm going to make an effort to uh, to check it out, get through the whole thing. Cool. So Switch exclusive, this demo is out now. If anybody's interested, uh, definitely check it out. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing, I mean, just like so amazed that they have given just sort of the presentation so much attention and this like the soundtrack. Like I said, I've, I listened to the soundtrack quite a few times, but that has also gotten a huge sort of like facelift since the original one. Like the original one, it was like a good soundtrack, but it, it definitely had that Super Nintendo sort of <laughs> level of sound to it. But <laughs> this one is like amazing, especially the the Chinese segment when you're going through the bamboo forest and everything. It sounds really good. Cool. Did you fight any of the tigers in the bamboo, bamboo oh, forest? Oh, you fought so many tigers. Oh, really? No, I just ran away. Oh, really? Oh, give him the yep. old uh, the chipmunk kick or whatever <laughs> he does. <laughs> no, I didn't beat up any tigers. I wasn't feeling up to uh, it. Okay. No, I I love the, I mean, every, each premise in this game is so just bizarre and unique, but I, I love the, the Kung Fu Shifu especially because he's just like, <laughs> he's like already level 99 or whatever. Yeah. Like, you notice he doesn't even earn experience from battles. I was just like, oh, because he's already like maximum level or whatever. Just, that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. There was a, a sequence in, in that little demo where he, uh, there's somebody blocking his way, which I, I, I thought was like, oh, how am I going to get past? Do I have to fight this person and get past them? And he just sort of like phase shifts through them, basically. <laughs> yeah. He does this like this little magical kung fu thing where he disappears and reappears behind them. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course, because he's a badass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So good. So far, none of them are like amnesiacs either. So that was nice. <laughs> that's there's always a plus yeah. yeah although there are like you know four more stories that i haven't played so there's still a chance it's possible cool all right yeah well i'm i'm intrigued by this i i'm i'm certainly interested in knowing more i, I do want to play the rest of the demo uh and uh yeah i was excited to hear your take on it because i know it's something that's you were much more <laughs> like aware of when it got sort of stealth dropped in one of those nintendo directs not too long ago yeah yeah let me tell you this you know i've talked about there's there's like a handful of Japanese RPGs that just didn't get released uh, outside of Japan for for a number of years, and the number of those games is slowly but surely dwindling down thanks to all these sort of re-releases and remasters we've gotten over the last few years. So yeah. and now I'm kind of curious. I feel like you know anything is on the table. We could just get some <laughs> crazy stuff announced in the next few years. Never say never. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, uh, let's wrap this show up. If you need any more video game hangover in your brain, you should follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash VG hangover. And you can always get show notes and links and tell us what you thought about this episode at VG hangover.com. Uh, we would love for you to join our discord. You can hang out with us and chat about video games and other fun pop culture stuff. You can get a link to that at VG hangover.com as well. Uh, please subscribe, rate and review us on Apple podcasts, Google podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon music, and anywhere else you can get a podcast. Uh, and help us out by telling your friends about the show. Yeah, one of the best ways for, where, for people to hear about the show just uh, by word of mouth. So if, if you have a friend who's into video game podcasts and they're looking for something to listen to, just tell them about your, your pals at VG Hangover. Are we pals? Yeah, or is that yeah. the right word? <laughs> friend of the pod. Yeah, tell them you're a friend yep. of the pod. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna workshop that a little bit. Maybe we have to kick that around yeah. here. We'll see. We'll come back to that. Put a pin yeah. in it. Anyway, we want to give special thanks again this week to Saria Lemus for our intro and outro music. It would be awesome if you headed over to pettypanol.bandcamp.com, listen to some more of our stuff, maybe buy a few albums there. Yeah, do that. Um, we'll be back next week. Until then, this is Randy Dickinson. This is DJ Ross. Thanks so much for listening to Video Game Hangover. Have a good one. Good night. See ya.